Welcome to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. This week, we are going to look at Proper 23. Proper 23. Now, you might be asking yourself, how many of these are we going to have? Well, there's actually 29. And then we will enter into the season of Advent. Okay? So there's 29 propers. But we don't know which one we start with after Pentecost. It depends on the dates. Okay? There's actually proper 1 through 29. But depending on when Pentecost falls, which is dependent upon when Easter falls, that makes the difference where we start in. We might start in on proper 5. We might start in on proper 8. We might start in on proper 4. So now we are at 23. And we are looking at four texts for this time of sharing the scriptures. We are finishing Micah, Micah 6 and 7. And then we're beginning Jonah. And we'll look at the book of Jonah. Jonah has four chapters. Minor prophet, the minor prophet Jonah, which I'm sure you've heard about, Jonah and the whale. Then we're going to look at, thirdly, the book of Acts. And we will be closing the book of Acts through the 28th chapter today. And next week, we'll be getting some work on the book of Revelation. And then fourthly, we'll be looking at our gospel reading, which is the book of Luke. And we've been in Luke for several weeks now. We will continue our journey with Jesus in the book of Luke. Let's begin in Micah. Micah chapter 6. This is what the Lord says. So right at the beginning at verse 1, it says, listen to what the Lord says. That's a very important thing to do when you're reading your scriptures. So as you're reading them, again, you've heard me say many times, you want to read the text. You want to pray. You want to listen to what God is saying to you. Again, there's two things going on here. One is what is the Lord saying in that scripture at that time? What, you know, Old Testament, New Testament. Prophet, history book, letter of Paul, gospel, revelation, minor prophets, major prophets, Pentateuch. The question is, what is God saying at that time? And then secondly, what is God saying to you at that time through his word? Okay? This is what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, verse 2, chapter 6 of Micah, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. So what you have in the prophets is a very dynamic relationship that the people of Israel have with God. And the prophet is speaking the word of the Lord to the people to consider seriously what God is saying And most of the time, it's about amendment of life. There is certainly some theology present, but a lot of times it's amendment of life and a course correction that you want uh, to have in terms of returning to the Lord. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened to you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron, Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled. This is in Numbers And what Balaam, son of Beor, answered, Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? What should I do in order to make it right with God? It's a great question. Verse 8 of chapter 6 of Micah is one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible. Read closely. Listen closely. He has showed you, O man, what is good. Oh, okay, what is it? What does the Lord require of you? Now he's going to answer the question. This is one of the most oft-quoted scriptures in the Bible. To act justly to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. If we could all live those three tenets out, it would be fabulous. So if you're looking to say, hmm, how does God want me to live? Or what does he want me to do? What does he require of me? 
What is good? What is the right path? Micah 6, 8. Chapter 7. What misery is mine? I am one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard, verse 1. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the early figs that I crave. And he talks, he said, the godly have been swept from the land. No one, one upright man remains. All men lie in wait to shed blood. Both hands, verse 3, are skilled at doing evil. The rulers demand gifts. The judges accept bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. And so we have this, these verses, uh, chapter 7, 1 through 7 on Monday. What's going on here? And it's falling apart. The people of Israel are falling, falling, uh, falling apart. They are not doing what God says. They are not listening to the Lord. They are not listening to his word. Now, this is not in your uh, list of readings, but those of you listening to me, please read chapter 7, 18 to 20. Very good. Chapter 7, 18 to 20. It's not listed in the daily lectionary readings, but I strongly encourage you to read it, okay? It's very good. It's a wonderful ending to Micah. All right, we are going to now look at the book of Jonah. We are now going to look at the book of Jonah. Jonah is a minor prophet, and he has a problem. And his problem is he does not want to do what God tells him to do. He does not want to do it. And Jonah comes right before Micah, and he has four chapters. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah, chapter 1. Verse 2, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. It's a very wicked place, Nineveh. And this is Assyria, okay? Very bad people. And their wickedness is so horrible that God is going to send a prophet to preach to them, to turn away. Now, Nineveh is a strange people, uh, uh, and a very evil people and very dangerous. In fact, the Assyrians took Israel into captivity uh, in 721 BC. So Noah, uh, Jonah is the person that he's calling. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah and Jonah runs away. I'm not going to do that. He goes down to Joppa. He finds a ship. He pays a fare. He's fleeing from the Lord. Have you ever fled from the Lord before? Ah, no, Lord, I'm not going to do that. And you, you've, you heard the Lord. You, you read a scripture. You were praying. You know that the Holy Spirit spoke to you. And you said, uh, uh I'm not doing that. Read the book of Jonah. And so what happens in the first chapter is he's running. And then, of course, we have the famous verse where the whale swallows him. And he was in the fish three days and three nights. Uh, you ever heard that before? Three days and three nights in the belly of the whale? This is Jesus in the heart of the earth. So a beautiful metaphor and um, preparation for the Messiah being in the earth for three days, three nights, okay? So uh, he provides a great fish to swallow Jonah because Jonah is in, on a boat. Everything goes south. There's wind and waves. They figure out, hey, you're the guy that's causing all this problem. Uh, and they cast him overboard and <laughs> the wind dies down. Okay? And then the fish swallows Jonah. So then Jonah prays like anybody would pray in a situation like that. He called to the Lord in verse 1, from the depths of the grave I called for help and you listened. And he says in verse 8, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs, but I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. So he prays, and he says something very positive about God. The Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. So he, there's a word that God has. Most of the time, the prophet says, sure, I'll go do that. Jonah says, no. He runs away. He causes a calamity in the boat that he takes refuge in. God finds him. God knows where we are, people. And the people that were in that boat said, something's wrong going on here. Who are you? And when they throw him overboard, everything gets much better. The fish, the great fish swallows him. He prays. God rescues him. 
Then he said, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message. And the Ninevites believed it. They believed it. They said yes. And they called on the Lord. They gave up their evil ways in chapter 3. And verse 10, when God saw that they had done well and they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened because of their sin. So there's a beautiful example, beautiful example of repentance and turning away from wrongdoing and the Lord not executing wrath upon those who have sinned against him. Now you'd think that Jonah would be all excited about that. I know that you're a gracious and compassionate God, verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, slow to anger and abounding in love. Why? But he's upset. Jonah's upset. What's wrong, Jonah? And he made himself a shelter, it says in verse 5 following, and the Lord provides a vine. He makes it grow over Jonah to give him shade. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine and it withered. The sun rose. There was a scorching east wind. The sun got on Jonah's head. God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do. I'm angry enough to die. So his attitude about this fantastic miracle that happened through him was not evidenced. The Lord said, You've been concerned about this vine, no, you, though you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died. Nineveh had over 100,000, 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle. Shall I not be concerned with that great city? You're more worried about a vine than you are the 120,000 that are going to be imperiled without repentance. There's a lot to think about in Jonah. Read it slowly. Read it carefully. Enjoy it. It's a fantastic reading. Fantastic reading. Now, you'll notice in your, in your uh, listing of um, scriptures, E-C-U-L-U-S, E-C-C-L-U-S, Ecclesiasticus. Now, I don't do Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus because it's Apocrypha. So we have that reading in the rest of 23 on uh, proper 23 on Friday and Saturday, and then in proper 24, proper 25, and proper 26. So I will be spending more time in the readings uh, in the New Testament, uh, and then we'll come back uh, to the Old Testament when we uh, do not have the Apocrypha listed there, for those of you that are interested in that. Now, if you want to read Ecclesi Ecclesiasticus, go right ahead. Uh, it is Apocrypha. It is in the Roman Catholic Church. It is regarded as Scripture, but not in the Protestant Church. We go to Acts 26. Now, we are closing in on the end of Acts. We have 26, 27, and 28 that we're covering today. Now, Paul has um, gone through an arduous journey, beginning in Jerusalem, where they were beating him to death, and the Romans rescued him. And then he goes uh, by night to Caesarea because they were going to kill him. Remember the 40 people, 40 men who were not going to eat or drink until they killed Paul. And now in 26, we are before Agrippa. And this is a fabulous scripture. In chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26 of Acts, Paul recounts his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Remember, in chapter 9, he was going on the road to Damascus so he can get orders to put Christians in prison because he believed that they were blaspheming because he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And, of course, they said that he was. And so Paul was this extraordinarily dangerous person. But on the road to Damascus, Jesus revealed himself to him and showed him who he was. And, of course, his life was changed dramatically. And if you read through 26... Uh, 1 through 23, you will see some of the things he said. Look at what, uh, what is written in Acts chapter 26, verse 17. I will rescue you from your people. This is Jesus talking. And from the Gentiles, I am sending you to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. Sounds very much like Jonah. And from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins, like Jonah, and, and the Ninevites that received forgiveness, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So amazingly, we have this juxtaposed to um, 
the book of Jonah in the third chapter where Jonah does finally preach the word of the Lord and the people of Nineveh repent. He says in verse 19, So then King Agrippa was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea and to the Gentiles also. I preached they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. And he says at the end of uh, in verse 23 that the Christ would suffer that as, and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and then to the Gentiles. And then Festus says, you are out of your mind, Paul. You are, your great learning is driving you insane or mad. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Short time along, Paul says in verse 29, I pray that God, not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these change. And then in verse 32, Agrippa says, said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. But the whole point was for him to go to Rome. And so in 27, we have this extraordinary story that Luke gives us about going to Rome and the storm and the shipwreck in 27. And then in 28, he goes ashore on Malta. So what you want to get out of 26 is this extraordinary story that Paul recounts to Festus and Agrippa about his encounter with Christ. And in 27, he's on his way to Rome to see Caesar. And we find this extraordinary interplay of the power of the storm and the power of God in terms of getting there. And then when he gets there to Malta, he has this incredible situation where a snake bites him and uh, he is uh, healed miraculously. He finally gets to Rome and he preaches at Rome under guard. Three days later, he called the leaders of the Jews. This is 2817. When they ascended, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I've done nothing against our people or against the custom of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people, For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. And so Paul continued to work and to minister and to preach and to share the gospel in that situation, preach in that situation. And it says, for two whole years, verse 30, and he wrote epistles too, He stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So he continued to do ministry. He was under some kind of house arrest to do that, but they actually gave him quite a bit of freedom. So the journey from Jerusalem to um, Rome to appeal to Caesar was quite extraordinary, and Luke gives us that information in the latter books of Acts. Jesus in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. We're continuing to see, we're about in the middle of our campaign, and we're continuing to see some Jesus do some just extraordinary things. Now remember, he's doing all kinds of miracles. The miracles in and of themselves are real, and they are powerful, and they are from God. But the key is that our minds and hearts would be open to the Lord And we would recognize his divinity and his power, and we would submit to him and follow him. So in 26 following, we have the healing of a demon-possessed man who was immensely powerful uh, in the Gadarenes, Gerasenes, I'm sorry, in the region of the Gerasenes, uh, across the lake from Galilee, which would have been, he would have been in Gentile territory. And Jesus does the impossible by casting out the demons. A dead girl and a sick woman. Here, Jesus does an extraordinary job in healing. And he raises a woman, a little girl from the dead, the house of Jairus, verse 51. All the people were wailing and mourning. Stop wailing. She's not a dead but asleep. And they laughed at Jesus. This is verse 53. He took her by the hand. My child, get up. And her spirit returned. Give her something to eat. So he's casting out a devil at the end of eight, 
uh, middle of eight, chapter eight. He's healing this sick woman who came behind him in verse 44 and touched the edge of his cloak. Who touched me? She comes forward and she was healed miraculously. Then he raised a dead girl from the dead. Do you know anybody can do any one of those three things, much less all three? He sends out the 12 in chapter nine to give them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases, chapter nine, verse one and two. He sends them out to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Now, they're the ones that are going to be doing this ministry after he dies and is resurrected from the dead and ascends into heaven, Acts chapter 1. So he's got to teach them. He has to disciple them. So he has 12 disciples, one who is going to be a traitor, Judas, who is going to kill himself. But he's going to train them and disciple them in this three-year period. And he's going to teach them about the kingdom of God, about himself. And he's going to give them opportunities to do ministry. He's going to give them power and authority. That's the two things you've got to have. You have to have the authority to do something, but then you have to have the power to carry it out. You have no power or no authority. You can't make anything happen. You can have authority, but no power. Can't go very far. You have power, but no authority. It's, uh, it doesn't go well for those that you're exercising or exerting the power against. Properly placed authority and power are fantastic. And so they're used to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And so they went from village to village preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. The next instance of the miracle working power of Jesus has to do with the feeding of the 5,000. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. He healed all of those who needed healing. Chapter 9, verse 11. And the crowd didn't have enough to eat. And this is only 5,000 men. This is not women and children. So he could have had fifteen to 20,000 people there. Five loaves and two fish. Who can do that? Peter confesses Christ. He asks them, who do the crowd say that I am? This is uh, chapter 9, verse 18. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. Still others, one of the prophets. What about you? Who do you say that I am? And for all of you listening and watching, that's the same question to all of us. Who do you say that Jesus is? Now, what we're trying to do in this gospel lessons, in the daily lectionary readings, is show you who Jesus is. But in the end, after you've done all this reading and prayer and thought about it, and reflection, and maybe even some study, you got to ask the question and answer the question, who do you say that Jesus is? Peter says the Christ of God. He tells him that he's going to suffer, and he's going to be killed and be raised on the third day. He's transfigured before them. In the rest of that chapter, the great transfiguration, he shows them the glory. He comes down and heals the boy with an evil spirit. So we just go from one pericope to the next. We go from one life event to the next. As these gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, were uh, illumined by the Holy Spirit, they were led by the Holy Spirit to share the ministry of Christ with us so that we would understand what he did in that first century and then we would respond to that. He talks about who the greatest is. The greatest in the kingdom of God is the least. Samaritan opposition. And then the cost of following Jesus. We close with this. And so um, we have the cost of following the Lord. And it is a great cost. We will pick up on that particular pericope next week when we look at uh, what it takes to follow Jesus. And it's a pretty hard saying. So as you're reading the miracles of Jesus, reflect upon those. But as you listen to the words and the teachings and the questions he asks us, that is significant also. So there's a lot to think about today. We have the wonderful words of Micah 6 and 7 and the people of Israel and the great Micah 6, 8 verse. We have Acts 26, 27, and 28, the ending of Acts, and how Paul finally gets to Rome. And they are not pugilistic, if you will, against him. They are not going to kill him. That happens later. Uh, right now, at the end of 28, he's moving around pretty freely, and he's in Rome, and, um, and uh, eventually they, they are going to let him out. Uh, and then finally, the work of Jesus, just an astonishing person. So, enjoy your reading this week. May God bless you and your reading and your study and listening to God speak to you. We'll see you next week for Proper 24. God bless you. 
and have a wonderful week of study.